Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Nadini and uh, Ron. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to, uh, so I'll quickly summarize the, some of the recent work that uh, the, we did. As, I mean, it's, uh, by the way, it's, it's really an honor to try to uh, speak first and sort of uh, uh, give a brief introduction of uh, the, the work that uh, we've been working on on some um, uh, two-dimensional Van der Waals materials in the last uh, couple of uh, uh, years. And, and this work actually started uh, with a talented graduate student, Levin Chen, and then the, working with uh, uh, Ho when he was doing sabbatical at, at Rice. And then uh, more recently, we've been collaborating with uh, the group of uh, uh, Elton and, and also uh, Oliver at, at the Duke University. And then all the measurement is, is actually done at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And then uh, some of the more recent measurement is done in, in Japan and with neutron scattering. The samples are mostly grown here at, uh, at Rice by, by, by Lebin and, uh, and, and Bin. So, so this whole thing actually uh, started uh, from, from the work of uh, Xiaodong and collaborators, basically uh, discovering that the two-dimensional uh, 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 magnetic material such as chromium triiodine can have a long range magnetic order even in a, in a single monolayer. This was uh, unprecedented uh, you know, a couple of uh, years ago. And what's really interesting in, in this sort of a class material is that the, uh, the ferromagnetism actually uh, sort of a, uh, exists in the single monolayer, but as soon as you switch the system into a, a bilayer system, and then it's actually coupled the anti ferromagnetically along the C axis. And basically, as shown, there's basically no net magnetization. And this is actually a very, very interesting in the sense that uh, it basically tells us that the, the bulk Hamiltonian of the system is not as simple as a, a simple ferromagnet. Uh, you know, so this, uh, the, the try to understand this is actually interesting. Also, the, the Curie temperature system doesn't really change that much. It changes from 61 Kelvin to 45 degree Kelvin. So, so if you look at the, the, the honeycomb lattice materials, it's, it's actually very, very analogous to, to graphene. And this is sort of a picture that we, we took from a recent publication. Basically, you have these chromium ions and then connected with either iron or some, you know, there are a whole class of these materials, either germanium or toroid. You can basically change, you know, uh, iron or uh, with, with a different, you know, element and still maintain the, the honeycomb lattice uh, uh, structure. And, and some of these materials would have a moment along the C-axis, whereas others would have a moment uh, uh, in the plane. And, and the question basically, and most of these materials are actually sort of uh, insulating or, or semiconducting. And, and the basic question one wants to ask is, uh, you know, how, how close they are uh, as compared with the electronic dispersion of, of a graphene. And, and from, you know, neutron scattering perspective, you know, how does the spin excitations, uh, you know, differ from uh, your, your typical uh, simple ferro magnet? So let's uh, look at the, the simple, uh, you know, analogy in terms of graphene. In the case of graphene, it's well, very well known that you have a two atom per unit cell. And that basically says your electronic dispersion uh, would have a, a so-called electronic uh, uh, Dirac point with a very, very high velocity near the Dirac point. And then if you think about, uh, you know, you, you're putting a, uh, instead of a, a pure electron with our magnetism at each of the honeycomb lattice, you put the, a spin down there. And then you basically, again, would have uh, two uh, spins uh, per unit cell. And, and from a, a magnum perspective, or, or basically what we call the spin, you know, a dispersion perspective, you would, again, in the case of an insulator, would have a, a two a spin with branches. One would call uh, people call a uh, sort of a, a acoustic spin with branch. And you would also uh, you know have an optical spin with branch. And, and the touching point is again uh, so sort of the, the direct point. And except uh, in this case, then you 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 instead of have an electronic dispersion, and you would have a, a you know a spin wave dispersion. And spin wave of course is uh, is uh, is a boson. So so this uh, sort of analogy of uh, you know. Uh, uh, a spin of a coupling in the case of a, a pure graphene, Haldin was the one you know originally pointed out. Even in the simple case of a pure graphene, if the spin of a coupling becomes very very important, and then you can basically open up a gap at the so-called electronic Dirac point, and therefore you can have potentially have an electronic you know sort of a electron edge mode. But unfortunately, in the case of a graphene. The spin of a coupling is extremely small because uh, the, the the number of electrons in the case of a uh, you know carbon is, uh, is is rather small. But one can play the same analogy, you know, in in the case of a uh, 
uh, in, the, in the case of uh, uh, spin waves. And basically uh, thinking about the, in terms of a spin wave dispersions, you know, what would actually happen uh, to your spin waves, uh, both in terms of acoustic and optical spin waves, uh, if, if the spin upper coupling uh, becomes important. So, so in this case, uh, one can basically write down sort of the Hamiltonian of, of the system. And then of course you would have a, a regular uh, Hamiltonian such as a, a sort of a Heisenberg type of exchange. As I mentioned earlier, uh, in, in the case of a simple uh, Heisenberg exchange, you would expect acoustic and optical uh, spin waves. And in most materials, if you have a, a magnetic order and then spin align along a particular direction, and you will also have what we call the single iron anisotropy and basically uh, open up a gap at the Dirac point. Uh, yeah, no, not at Dirac point, but open up a gap at the gamma point and uh, basically give rise to sort of a pointing uh, direction of the spins. In terms of a spin of a coupling, and you can, in this case, would potentially have what people call the Zinsky Maria interaction. In this case, uh, because it requires anti-symmetric. So, uh, uh, so that basically can only occur in the second year's neighbor. And you can also uh, potentially have uh, what people call Katab interaction, uh, first uh, pointed out by Nadini's group in terms of uh, honeycomb lattice materials. And in this case, you, know, you would in principle expect uh, to open up a, a gap uh, in terms of uh, you know, magnal spectra uh, at the, uh, the Dirac point. And the consequence of this magnal spectra, I mean, it can be opened either by Katayev interaction or Dazinski uh, Maria's interaction. Uh, the, the consequence of open up a, a, a gap at the Dirac point is that, uh, you know, uh, potentially due to spin up coupling, is that uh, instead of, uh, you know, a, a magnons uh, uh, running in one direction, you can have essentially magnons uh, circulating uh, only in, in one direction. And, and uh, in principle, one should uh, be able to actually see this in, in thermal uh, sort of a transport measurement. And, and, and therefore, you know, this uh, is basically uh, to be topological. And, and therefore, you know, we have a sort of a, a potential uh, like tremendous uh, interest. So, so like I mentioned earlier, uh, in the case of uh, a chromium triangle, the Dazinski maria interaction is actually with an uh, uh, interaction vector along the C-axis. And this is because uh, when, when you have a, a spin waves in the system, a spin wave basically vibrating of spins along the or original or points. So, so in the case of a, a, a honeycomb lattice, uh, your dazinski maria interaction basically requires uh, your D vector, that product of SI Dallas J. And in this case, uh, your spin waves actually, uh, implant component of a spin waves, SI Dallas J is actually along the C axis. And therefore, in order for the, the uh, Dazinski Maria interaction to be uh, important, and, and your, your spin has to be uh, aligned along uh, the C axis. Therefore, if you force the spin uh, into the plane, and then the Dazinski Maria interaction will basically vanish. And this turns out uh, to have uh, you know, interesting effect and can be tested uh, experimentally. So, so we started the, our experiment a couple of years ago, initially trying to basically looking at the, 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 the simple, you know, a spin wave excitations of this uh, a chromium uh, triangle uh, uh, of lattice materials and uh, with the in last neutron scattering experiment. So basically what we do is uh, actually uh, very, very simple. Basically we do this um, uh, in terms of uh, looking at uh, the, uh, 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 just uh, simply, uh, uh, you know, energy dependence of uh, uh, spin waves. And, and shown here is, is a two-dimensional uh, uh, map uh, of a reciprocal space uh, projected uh, within uh, the HK0 uh, uh, plane. Basically, we, we're looking at uh, this uh, uh, honeycomb lattice plane. And then, you know, as I have uh, shown here, uh, this is basically uh, as a function of a changing uh, as a function of a changing energy, uh, as we gradually uh, mapping the energy from low energy to high energy up. Basically, initially we would see, because it's, it's a simple furrow magnet, initially we would expect to see a spin waves uh, stemming from, uh, from the gamma point. And as we gradually move up in energy, and then the spin waves will, will gradually, you know, move to the, uh, 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 finish the acoustic mode, and then moving to the optical mode. And the key point is actually where the, where the Dirac point, you know, here, where there's actually vanishing intensity. And you can see this actually, you know, more clearly uh, in, in, the, in this uh, sort of overall dispersion curve. Uh, and that's actually uh, been mapped out by, uh, by Lebin. And, and this is, for example, is a chromium triangle uh, measured at the two Kelvin, uh, well within the, uh, uh, the long range uh, ferromagnetic state where the moment is entirely along the C axis. You can entirely see this uh, sort of a dispersion curve 
uh, and this is sort of a fitting of, of this entire dispersion curve. Initially, we only thought about the fitting this dispersion with, uh, uh, with a Heisenberg model, but immediately we see the Heisenberg model without the, you know, uh, the Zinsky maria interaction cannot really account for the presence of this gap at, at the Dirac point. And for our initial you know, measurement, we only consider the zinsky maria interaction, and basically we can completely uh, fit this uh, dispersion curve as shown here uh, with this sort of parameter. And the other thing that's sort of interesting is actually what actually happens uh, at, the, uh, at the gamma point. And it turns out that later we had found that after seeing Nadini's result, you know, uh, such a dispersion can be equally well fitted uh, by Heisenberg model plus a Katav interaction. You know, so, so therefore, uh, if just by looking at the uh, neutron scattering spectra at the uh, zero external magnetic field, basically, uh, you know, we cannot really tell, you know, which model is actually uh, correct. So the other thing that we noticed uh, immediately uh, by looking at the fitting this uh, dispersion curve is uh, by looking at the, uh, the, 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 the C-axis uh, dispersion curve uh, at the different implant H and K zero directions. And based on looking at the different, uh, you know, dispersion curves at different HK zero point, we can see a clearly a variation of the dispersion along the C-axis, because neutron scattering is a ball probe, and we can basically map out the, the dispersion of uh, spin excitations in, uh, you know, reciprocal space along any of the uh, three directions, HK and L. So what, but what bas basically what these measurements basically tells us is that your nearest neighbor exchange interaction along the C-axis is actually anti ferromagnetic instead of ferromagnetic, as so naively thought about. And your second nearest neighbor exchange interaction along the C-axis is actually uh, ferromagnetic. And because the fact that you have a more second nearest neighbor than the nearest neighbor in the case of uh, you know, a honeycomb lattice, and the total ex exchange interaction is actually ferromagnetic, and basically uh, you know, give rise to the reason the whole system is actually a ferromagnet. And this can potentially explain, you know, why when you have a bilayer system, that the system is actually uh, anti ferromagnetic And the other thing that, as I mentioned earlier, we noticed is that you have a very, very tiny uh, single ion anisotropy gap uh, at, the gamma, uh, at the gamma point. And this gap, it turns out to be only about the 0 0.4 millivolt as seen in neutron scattering experiment. And from these sort of uh, data, we can uh, entirely uh, fit the exchange coupling constant uh, in the case of a bulk with uh, you know, a different exchange coupling, J. And then uh, with the dazinsky maria interaction, this is what we fitted, and then with anisotropy gap. And furthermore, okay. you know, after seeing, oh, only have five minutes? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Furthermore, after looking at the, the, the data from, uh, uh, from, from the, the, the idea from Nandini's group, we tried to fit the experiment uh, with, uh, 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 we try to fit the experiment with, in addition with uh, Dazinsky Maria, with Katav interaction, we find, you know, with certain amount of parameters, we really cannot tell uh, the differences between these two models. So one way to separate these uh, differences between the two models is by applying an external magnetic field. Because you can, uh, the, the in, in the initial state, the, the moment is entirely along C-axis, but you can put a, a very small magnetic field and, and tune the moment uh, into the AB plane. And in the case of Katav interaction, your spin wave is expected to change dramatically when, when you change the moment direction from C to AB plane. Whereas in the case of, uh, whereas in the case of uh, 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 you know, Dazinsky and Maria interaction, you only expect to see a spin wave near the Dirac point to change. Everything else you know, expect to be uh, more or less uh, the same uh, from, uh, from a simulation. So this is sort of the experiment that we see uh, on uh, you know, implant core aligned crystals. And this is a, a zero field experiment where the moment is along C. And then when we tune the moment in the AB plane, uh, it changes like that. And then we try to understand this, you know, with either uh, Dazinsky-Maria or with a Katayev type of model. It seems like uh, Dazinsky-Maria seem to fit the overall spectra much better because we don't really see too much change uh, when we change uh, the moment from the C axis to the AB plane. So in the remaining, yeah. So this is sort of the, uh, the same conclusion that I have reached earlier basically uh, concluding based on magnetic field experiment, the, the data seem to be more, to be understood better with the uh, Dazinsky maria type of model. So finally, uh, let me uh, sort of share like a, a one or two more slides on, on some other, you know, honeycomb lattice magnet. If you reduce the, 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 the spin upper coupling by reducing uh, the, the legend, you know, uh, changing from iodine to, to uh, some other materials, 
And then basically the gap at the Dirac point essentially uh, disappears. And this was done systematically by, by, the, by, the, by, the German, by the German group by looking at the chromium germane uh, uh, terrorite compared with the chromium silicon uh, terrorite. And the other thing that's interesting that we have uh, done recently is looking at the, uh, purely uh, the spin lattice coupling in the case of a chromium germane terrorite. We find this material to be extremely interesting because if you look at the spin waves in such a material, along the C-axis spin wave is basically resolution limited. Whereas within the AB plane, the spin waves are extremely broad. And such a broad spin wave also does not follow the Bose population factor. If you look at the implant spin wave, you know, the intensity, if you can uh, compare with uh, uh, you know, dynamic stability actually reduces along the CS, they more or less the same. So, so if you look at the overall spin wave exchange interaction and they are broad at all the wave vectors we look at and really doesn't couple with the acoustic and optical phonons. So we thought that this particular material, you know, typically in, in a, a thorough magnet with um, a, a electron a spin lattice coupling, you would expect the spin wave and, and phonons to intersect, you know, at the point when the intersection, you open up a gap and then you have a spin lattice coupling. We're, we're seeing the, the chromium germane terrorite, we, we actually realized that this, uh, this uh, spin lattice coupling is sort of a normal type of spin lattice coupling. Basically, we argue, is uh, uh, due to sort of the zero point motion. Basically, it's really due to the by water factor motion uh, of the lattice. So since I don't have uh, too much time to talk too much about this, uh, so I'll, I'll sort of uh, 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 put a, a final conclusion. And this uh, excitation also does not follow uh, the total moment summary. So let me uh, put a summary uh, slide. So basically uh, we, we found uh, in the case of the magnons uh, for chromium triandine, Filing material, uh, there seemed to be a, a Dirac gap and also a gap uh, at the gamma point. And uh, the, the gap at the Dirac point seemed to be better understood with the Zinsky Maria interaction. And then we also found that for chromium germanium terrorite, there's a tremen tremendous amount of uh, spin lattice coupling. And that's actually quite different from your regular spin lattice coupling. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Feng Cheng. That was uh, an excellent introduction and then to the topic. Um, are there questions, Arun, in the chat? Uh, no, actually not. No one has posted questions at this point. Okay. Well, um, maybe... Um... But, uh, think think since you have time and... Uh, you can, you can just ask, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can just ask, right? I mean, I can, I can just answer, yeah. Yeah. So... So one thing I, I wanted to ask is about this last part that you uh, went over quickly. So I don't right. know, I mean, since we have a few minutes, maybe you want sure, to- Sure, sure, sure. Oh, I want yeah. to, you want, you, want, you, want to, you want to speak more? Let me, let me share my, let me share my screen again, because I- I guess I, I had a bit. question about the sound, oh, um, you know, in the last part. Um, okay, yes. Where, where was the, so were you looking at a certain window within which uh, the sum rule was not obeyed and uh, what was precise? Yeah, we, 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 yeah so we, we, we're actually looking at, I mean, in, in any insulating furrow magnet, I mean, can, you, can you guys see my screen? See my yeah. screen? Yeah. Yeah, in any kind of a, you know, a, a insulating furrow magnet, you, you would expect the total moment of a system to be, to be conserved. Basically, you know, a summarizing as this. Yes. And you have the elastic scattering part, you have the spin wave part. And, and typically, as you increase in temperature, your elastic part is expected to decrease with decreasing with increasing temperature. Whereas your inelastic part is expected to increase with increasing temperature because of both population factor. So right. what actually happens in the chromium triandine is that if you look at the if you look at the, the spin waves, the elastic part they indeed decrease as a function of increasing temperature. But if you look at the inelastic part, but by summing up, up by summing up the spin wave within the entire Brillouin zone they also decrease dramatically with increasing temperature, completely disobeying. And this basically suggests excitations that we're actually seeing. It, it's not a, a pure spin excitations, rather potentially you know, associated with, uh, with lattice, lattice vibrations, therefore you know, uh, disobey the, uh, the total moment sum rule. So that, that, was our, that, that was basically our argument. And, and this, is also seen, this is also seen in the raw data. And you know, in, in the raw data, if you, if you look at the raw data, uh, comparing the spin waves uh, within the plane along the C-axis, you can see along the C-axis, as you increasing temperature, this is a divided up with the, the, the Bose population factor already. 
that you can see as you increase temperature, they perfectly follow the both population factor. But if you look at the implant spin waves, as you increase it, once you divide the both factor, you can clearly see the reduction. So this basically suggests the excitations that are actually seen in, in here is, uh, is, is not your conventional, you know, pure spin waves. And this actually is rather, you know, to see spin wave damping is actually extremely rare. And in most uh, insulating far-off magnet, you, your spin wave should be uh, basically resolution limited, you know, at, at any, you know, in, in the case of insulator, because the spin wave is only transverse excitations. And the spin wave damping typically occur extremely. And for metals, you can have a lot of spin wave damping because you have itinerary electrons. But for insulators, it's extremely rare. And then and typically that only happens when, when spin wave, you know, meets some acoustic phonons or optical phonons. But as we have shown here, you know, in, in this particular case that you can see the spin wave dispersions, this is the red, your optical mode is actually here. Even in the region where there's no optical phonons at all, you can see a very, very broad spin wave excitations. So, so that, that's, you know, that, that's actually shown, you know, basically here. So that, that's really not there, understood at all. There yeah. are two more uh, questions. So maybe if you can okay. address them quickly. One is by Zach Addison. Uh, and he's asking if the Magnon band topology is different for DM plus J versus K plus J models. Would you know? Oh, you mean, you mean in terms of, well, I the, mean- for, The from, Berry from... curvature. The Berry curvature distribution. Is it different for these two models? I actually don't know that. I mean, I, okay. don't know. I mean, we, I know, I know both of them should be expected to open up a gap at the right point, but as, in terms of the consequences, you know, what is the, I mean, we cannot detect the edge mode anyhow, because the edge mode is, uh, is sort of a so tiny amount of the sample. We tried it, but, but we, you know, haven't been able to see anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And maybe one more question on Magnon phonons. Uh, so question about whether you have also measured the phonon dispersion and yes, we, why we, doesn't the magnon phonon interaction open a gap these two things yeah so so we actually have i mean uh, actually unfortunately i, I didn't we, we we measure selective yeah unfortunately i, I didn't put a slide in there we, we measure the selective uh, a number of phonons and, and the basically phonons follows the dispersion curve uh, very similar to the calculated to measure the entire you know phonon band it, it's it's very very difficult we have not had a chance to do that but at least the phonons seem to be following the dispersion curve at the places where we measured. But particularly importantly, you know, at these regions where there's no phonons, we still see a very, very broad magnum, which is, which, is, which is unconventional. I mean, this really provided strong evidence. It's really unconventional. Okay, I think we have to move on. There are still some questions. Yes, we'll take it thank up you. at the end. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Let's all thank Peng Cheng.